Thank you very much for the warm welcome. I will probably skip this uh, slide. I just wanted to introduce myself, but you did it uh, for me. I'm an educated arch architect, but in real life, I'm a programmer. Um, I'm a developer of tools for other architects and designers, and I'm an educator as well. Today, I'm going to talk about a discipline of architecture that is called computational design, um, which uh, actually means that architects as designers, we can use computers in an advanced way. In fact, we, when I explain that to, to people, I say that we are not designing buildings, but we are designing little pieces of software that then designs, uh, designs the building. Uh, so, in fact, we are designing creative machines that eventually design uh, the, the final product. That means that the control over the design is shifted from, um, from the moment, or the moment when the architecture happens, is shifted uh, from, from um, some individual um, uh, informed decision to some computer algorithm. Uh, very often uh, in this computational design, we use either biomimicry or morphogenesis, which means that we are somehow uh, repeating what the nature is usually doing, um, but still uh, all the decision making is completely deterministic. Uh, everything that we create is based on some uh, procedural decision making and on some data. Um, this way we can design with an unprecedented complexity, um, which is sometimes very useful, but what is super exciting for me about this approach is uh, the phenomenon of emergence. Emergence is the fact when, when the whole uh, is greater than sum of its parts, so uh, the result has features that you cannot find in the components that make the whole thing. The computational design today uh, actually has many branches, but I'm going to talk about two uh, m uh, biggest branches of the computational design. One is called continuous, where uh, this is the work of Zaha Hadid architects, um, where the design looks very smooth, and it's based on the notion that the situations in architecture and the design should change, alter smoothly, so you smoothly go through a flow of different situations that change and blend to each other gradually. The other approach is called discrete, uh, and this is the work of Jill Retzin, who is the main proponent of this um, approach, where you see that things look uh, much uh, coarser and rougher, and the final design consists of individual pieces, discrete modules and elements, and uh, among many other features that this has, I would like to mention one, um, and that's the notion of digital materials. Um, there is a distinction in this field uh, between analog and digital materials. Analog materials, they can be assembled in an infinite number of ways. So a brick, you can lay a brick in an in infinite number of ways. For example, you can create arches, um, which is which means that you don't know what is actually possible because everything is possible. On the other hand, uh, a brick of Lego is completely digital because it's constrained in the number of assembly options that you have. So there is a limited number uh, of ways how can you use the thing, which is incredibly, in incredibly important if you want to work with uh, the modules and the materials as data, uh, which we do want to do. From, from now on, uh, I'm mostly going to show uh, pictures of our own work at the Studio Subdigital, and we are trying to contribute to both of these fields of the computational design. So the continuous and the discrete. We started with the continuous because uh, we were amazed by the uh, phenomenon of emergence, things that happen um, on its own. So um, this is um, my work. As, as I said, I'm also a toolmaker for other people. So this is um, a case study for, a, uh, for my implementation of the uh, Craig Reynolds Boyd uh, algorithm for architects. You can use a simulation of a flock or swarm for um, design purposes. Um, I did that in 2014. And also, we wanted to uh, actually bring this to the real life. So uh, it's difficult and very expensive to design a building, so we tried something much smaller, and we designed, uh, designed a series of jewelry. So this is a ring that we actually uh, 3D printed, so it's, it's an actual photograph of a ring. And on this picture, I would like to demonstrate the emergence. So um, the thing is that we were designing um, a machine, a little creative machine, of flocking individual points uh, that were flying around a circle, because if you want to design a ring, we of course need to have a circle. And then uh, the little pieces that were flying around, they had certain behavior and intentions. 
And what happened when they were interacting with each other is the bottom part where you can see that, that something strange happened here. And that was unintentional, but I know exactly why it happened. So it's deterministic, but it was not designed by myself, but by the machine, that the creative machine that created this. The thing is that um, in our continuous or fluent um, period, we had kind of a sophisticated way how to create the abstract form, or we can say data, like this part. When we use the, the flocking algorithm to actually create something that is deterministic, meaningful, yet surprising, um, and this has to be turned into something real. It has to be materialized. And the method that we used for materializing quite sophisticated data was the, the method was kind of brute force. It wasn't really very sophisticated as much as what we see on the left uh, picture. So on the right picture, you see how we turned uh, a non-three-dimensional uh, curve into something three-dimensional. And the method is called either voxels or marching cubes, which is basically the same thing. And the voxels, they are three-dimensional pixels. They are cubes in space that are discrete, which is super important. But we basically used the brute force. We took the curve and placed voxels where the curve actually existed. So you see that there is some sort of uh, imbalance between the sophistication of the two methods. So therefore, we decided uh, more than a year ago to actually come up with a method how to materialize data in a more sophisticated way. Um, and uh, we found an existing algorithm that is used in uh, computer games development, which is called Wave Function Collapse. And uh, I'm just going to explain very quickly uh, what does it do. And, um, but first of all, uh, we introduced an, a new tool for architects, a creative tool that we named Monoceros. And uh, you see how does it look? It's, it's an implementation for architects in a, in a quite well-known uh, environment called Grasshopper. Um, and now architects can use the wave function collapse algorithm uh, for, for their creative purposes. So what does it actually do? And um, what does Monoceros actually do? So basically, you've got uh, three data types. One is called slot, which basically means some spatial envelope that you're intending to fill with certain modules, which is the second data type here. So the modules are the distinct individual discrete pieces that you assemble somehow to entirely fill an envelope of slots. And how do you do that? It has to be meaningful. Uh, we are introducing uh, some assembly rules. So basically, we are saying this module can be a neighbor of another module. And you define certain assembly rules, and then Monoceros actually assembles a uh, final result for you. And uh, I'm not going too much into details, but I want to um, mention one important notion. Unlike with other architecture or design approaches, we are not start starting with a, with a blank a paper or an empty slate. Quite the opposite, we are starting with the entire envelope completely filled with all the modules, basically potentials to place all the modules that are available. So we start, start with a space that is completely filled with modules. And then, according to the assembly rules, we are ruling out those modules that actually cannot be placed in certain slots of the envelope. So it means that instead of designing something from nothing, or by defining what is possible, we are defining what is actually not possible and ruling out the impossible options. So um, what do we do with Monoceros? Um, with Monoceros, I'm going to show a couple of case studies that we made uh, either in our office or uh, some other people did or during my teach, uh, teachings, some students I made. So this is, a, this is our own uh, uh, in-house work where we uh, wanted to assemble a large assembly that is basically a chandelier um, that we make sure that we are creating a very complex filled shape and the continuity of, of, the, of the neon parts uh, is secured by the, by the assembly process. Uh, the thing is that what you see here is that it all looks very blocky. It all looks like the voxels. So we wanted to somehow avoid it or prevent it. So I'm going to show on this picture here. Uh, we introduced some modules that are bigger than, than the voxels themselves. Uh, so you see that some of the neons are like melted and hanging. So this is also possible. We, uh, started to fight the, the blockiness and, and the rigidity of, of the grid uh, by introducing something that is kind of not following the grid, but still f is following certain um, assembly rules. Um, the next um, 
um, is, as an example of how, how can we diversify the modules that are being distributed over the spatial envelope. So you see that on the surface there is something that uh, is called a hard peel, or you can imagine that this is some sort of a fruit. So on the surface there is something that is a uh, full uh, surface, and then inside you've got something that is uh, made of pipes, and in the very middle there are some cores. So it means that uh, with the algorithm, not actually the wave function collapse that we, we adopted, but with monoceros that actually grew to, to be something much bigger than the core algorithm that we are still using, with monoceros we can decide where are we going to place what. So this is an example for, for that. Another thing that is very important is that you can use the assembly algorithm not only to take existing modules as they are and place them, but you can also just distribute certain data in a meaningful way. And this is another example of that, uh, how we distributed modules without actually having the geometry of the modules um, physically, but we just distributed data in a meaningful way. And then we did some design post-processing. Um, and what you can see here is we are somehow fighting the grid again, even though you see it there in, in, in a certain scale, but some areas are completely smooth and continuous, some areas are um, flat, and again, a little bit continuous, some areas remain blocky and made of modules. Um, this is a work of our interns last year at the studio where they used the, the Monoceros uh, process to design an actual building, a campus, and uh, this was uh, actually the first project where Monoceros, or the algorithm, was not the only um, method to design something, but it was just part of, of a larger creative method. So um, this was an important moment for us when we realized that we can make something bigger out of this algorithm. So it doesn't really have to be only a meaningful way of assembling modules uh, into an envelope, but it could be a part of a larger design process that however, has to be informed and aware of the principles of this sort of design. Um, I'm going to show uh, a couple of more pictures. This is quite fresh from my teachings at the UCL, Bar UCL Bartlett uh, two weeks ago. Um, this is what the students were able to, to do with Monoceros after one week of, of tutorials. Uh, you see that they were able to combine a couple of the design principles into one bigger uh, project and um, everything holds together, and even they manage to distribute uh, things where they actually should belong. Um, then another project that looks even more architectural and urban planning. Um, again, this is something that you can do after uh, two, a week of, of learning uh, without having any previous knowledge, but you can bring it then much further. So um, we started experimenting with actual architectural assembly. So um, what you see here is my tribute to, uh, to a very old project from uh, early 90s by a Dutch uh, office called MVRDV. Um, the, the project was called Berlin Voids and they made a huge section with uh, rooms that were non-standard. Like you, you can see that, that even here, uh, if this was a section through a building, you, there is a staircase here, but whenever you have a platform like this, you need to either have a staircase or a railing so that you don't fall down. So with Monoceros, we are able to do this in three dimensions, so we are able to, to make a, a whole volume made of um, rooms like this. And this is, again, without any post-processing, this is just pure Monoceros. Um, then um, an experiment that looks a little bit horrifying, but I kind of like it. Uh, you can design um, an urban structure or um, some sort of rural sprawl where uh, you've got little buildings with the gardens and pavements and, and road system. Everything holds together, everything uh, works quite well, uh, but if you look from, from distance you see that there are some, some dead ends and roads that are just like small like this and some uh, buildings that are uh, inaccessible, so yeah, like places like here and here. Um, because what Monoceros does, um, or did when, when this was happening, is that it only took care about the immediate um, um, neighborhood of, of modules. It doesn't really uh, take into account the whole big thing. So, but when we realized all these things, uh, we realized that this could be a new approach to architecture, or at least to uh, the computational design. And um, I would like to introduce a new term, and I'm trying hard to actually make this become a thing uh, on a theoretical level. So as we had the continuous and the discrete, I believe that could be something that is called, uh, could be called constraint design, which means that as architects, we are not 
only designing what is possible, but we are designing also what shouldn't be possible. We are adding more and more constraints to the design, and we let the creative machine to create something, and we are only harnessing the creative machine so that by adding more and more constraints so that there is only one possible solution, one viable solution at the end. And I first wanted to say that this is what is happening next, but this is actually what is happening right now. And again, uh, this is the first time publicly that I will show a couple of uh, notions that we are implementing right now, uh, not only on a theoretical basis, but we also teamed up with, a, with an industrial partner, and we are now working on the first real-life case study, uh, an urban plan uh, that is going to be placed here in Prague, and I will tell you the main notions of what we can do next with this uh, sort of approach, the constraint design. So one thing that we can do is we can work with a, an informed space. Once we have the, the spatial modules, we have the, the, uh, the, the, the envelope and, and the slots, we can inform the space. We can read the city as a, as a grid of um, information, data. We can scatter the data around um, the city. Not only that, we can pre-inform the modules. The modules themselves, the, the assembly pieces that we are putting together, they can contain certain data, some potentials, or some procedures that um, make decision for the algorithm that is assembling uh, the modules one to another. We can also have dy dynamic feature propagation, which means that once something is placed in the envelope, it can influence the whole envelope. So like we had the, the little village that didn't really make sense. So once you know that you placed something in the space, it means that some other things are possible or impossible somewhere else. And this can be done throughout the process. We can also combine the discrete assembly as we had it with other approaches uh, from that we learned from the continuous design, like swarming and emergence. So we can make um, a swarm of voxels that self-organize. At the same time, we can make the, de the constraint design decision-making. We can restrict the, the two autonomous algorithms. They can collaborate on creating something, something new. And finally, uh, we can uh, sample and extrapolate. So we can take an existing piece of design sample it into our modules, and extrapolate and create a new piece of design that has the same features. And the reason why we do this, there, there is a couple of reasons. Most of these things are very slow and kind of boring in architecture. So we want to use our human creativity to, to actually create something that is um, a little bit more um, fun than uh, following certain rules. And we can convert uh, the regulations, the physics, uh, the economy into data and then process them automatically. And as architects, as, as the authors, as the artists, we can just harness the creative machines that are actually assembling all these heavy lifting things together. And we can make sure that we like the envelope, we like the surroundings, and the actual assembly inside is happening automatically. Another reason for doing this is that this is really fast. And even in the prototyping phase that we are right now in, to design something like this, including the urban plan around, including involving all these things, once we have the algorithms, it, it's a matter of maybe a minute to generate a, a whole district or a building, and then we can evaluate. And the evaluation becomes an essential part of the assembly process, of the design process. So it's not that we design something, then evaluate, but the evaluation, because we have all the data inside of our modules and the envelopes, it is there. We can make decisions during the, the design process so that we are optimizing the result in real time. And if you imagine that it takes about a minute to generate a, a building like this, and then we can generate 100 buildings in 100 minutes, and we can pick the one that follows the, the rules and expectations the best, we can spend more time on the design, and the decision-making can be done much earlier than after weeks and weeks of planning. And that's it. Thank you very much for your attention. And I'll be happy to discuss.